Today I'm not going to give the Dhamma talk and it's the Venerable Atulo who is going to give the Dhamma talk today. Uh, there's a reason for that. Um, you won't see him for next, uh, I think maybe until next May, summer, I don't know. He's going to Sri Lanka. And if he falls in love with Sri Lanka, and he might stay there for a long time. <laughs> and, <laughs> and if he had enough or tired of Sri Lankan food, you know, <laughs> it's <a> spicy. <laughs> and then he will be happy to return to Canada. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, Sri Lanka is a, it's a beautiful island. And that's the uh, country to be. Uh, to live as a monk because lay people especially look after the monks. It's not like in the Western world. And uh, he's going to stay uh, at a beautiful forest monastery. And of course we have our uh, affiliations with some forest monasteries where we practice meditation. And uh, we also can send him to uh, our uh, forest monasteries too. Actually, they are beautiful ones, and it's just a matter of uh, him making time for that and going there. Um, so, I thought, you know, since he's going to be out of country, uh, when he was here in town, actually, it was very convenient for me. Uh, <laughs> when I go out of country, <laughs> I asked him to come and run this uh, Wednesday session. <laughs> But now I'm stuck. <laughs> I need to find another monk. Actually, the monk, another Canadian monk, we were, try <laughs> we were trying to convince him to stay in town, but I don't know, right? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I thought, you know, it would be good for him to give the Dhamma talk to all of you today. Uh, and. Uh, so that you would remember him, his, uh, uh, his Dhamma talk, his words of wisdom for your own spiritual uh, benefit. Although he will be out of uh, country for some months, but his words of wisdom will be staying with you. So uh, with much gratitude and respect, let's invite Venerable Atulo to deliver the Dhamma talk today. Uh, sad. Okay. So, uh, so uh, I don't know how long my words will stay. <laughs> it's kind of a tall order, but uh, um, it was kind of funny. Uh, it was actually about uh, three years ago. Uh, more than maybe even more than three years ago, but three years ago, I'd uh, come back to Toronto, and uh, as a young monk, when you first ordain, you have to, uh, especially in Canada, if you're an English speaker, there's only one place in Canada you can ordain. <laughs> At least there was when I wanted to that I knew of, and there you have to spend a year as what's called an anagarika. First, you have to keep eight precepts, then you have to spend a year as a samanera where you keep 10, you can no longer do uh, many other things after that. And then if you're still wanting to be a monk, then you can take your full ordination as a bhikkhu. And once you become a bhikkhu, then you have to stay uh, under the guidance of a teacher for five years. So you basically have to stay wherever your teacher sends you. If you want to leave the monastery, you have to ask permission. And it's kind of like uh, being, being re-raised, going from being like a, an adult who's independent to entering a monastery and being re-raised all over again from almost being like, you know, in preschool <laughs> to kind of going up. And so when you get close to your five years, you're kind of a, you have a, a bit itchy feet, you're kind of waiting, you're kind of, my five years are, <laughs> here they are, you know, it's just a few more months, I can go wherever I want, you can get out the door. And so you're kind of looking forward to that quite a bit. And so for many, uh, many years, I'd had this kind of dream to, uh, to go to Sri Lanka, actually, even uh, 
uh, many years before, uh, even before I ordained as a monk. And so I had this kind of plan that I'd, I'd had in the works for a good long time to come and spend what they call Vasa in the Toronto area and then to move along about three months later to, uh, to go to Sri Lanka. But uh, unfortunately at that time, uh, unexpectedly came down with these stomach problems and uh, other health problems and so I couldn't leave the uh, Toronto area. And so Vasa ended and there were a few more invitations and then I was still here and so couldn't leave. And actually didn't know anybody in the Toronto area really. I mean, I knew people <coughs> from when I was a layman, but uh, that's a very different thing. Being a monk and being a lay person are different. Kind of the, the friends you knew kind of growing up, like you used to kind of go hang out to go to movies and, you know, get drunk or whatever. <laughs> and as a monk, you don't do those things anymore. So those relationships are no longer as supportive or as sustaining. So I come up with this kind of idea, another thing that monks tend to long for when their, their time is coming up where they're free, where they can wander at will, is they tend to long for solitude. Okay, you spend a lot of time in a monastery, and the monasteries have very strict schedules quite often. You can't do whatever you want. I mean, you do whatever is on the schedule. <laughs> and uh, if your teacher wants you to do something, you have to do that. And so you, it depends what's going on in the monastery. You could have a nice plan laid out for some project you want to do, but something happens in the monastery, you have to give that up. You can't do it. So what you tend to be craving, kind of really looking forward to, is having this opportunity where you can meditate as much as you want. Basically where your only duty during the day is to get up in the morning and sweep your kuti, that's this kind of monk's hut, and then after that your day is free. Your day is free to devote to meditation. This is kind of the, what they call the majjima. Majjima means middle. It's kind of the dream of uh, many middle monks, is to go out wandering and find this kind of freedom. So when I first came back to the city, that was the dream that was on my mind. And so I, uh, I didn't, uh, didn't really associate with many people for, for a while, you know, for maybe for like eight months or something like that. I just kind of kept to myself and uh, tried to live the uh, Majima monk's life dream. But then one of the interesting things that, uh, that tended to find was that if you're just a monk living in the West, <laughs> people here don't know what monks do. <laughs> don't really know anything about what monks are like. They, a lot of people think monks are lazy. That's one of the interesting things that I didn't expect. But yeah, many people in the West, if they see a monk, they think they're kind of lazy and just lounge around. And so what I tended to find was that after eight months, it didn't seem to be working out too well. It was working out all right, but uh, something was missing. And so then, uh, interestingly enough, I had a friend who, uh, who became a monk later at the same monastery where I ordained, and he knew uh, Bhante Saranapala. And so uh, he said, uh, Bhante Saranapala wants to meet you. And uh, this was, I was going away somewhere, and so I came back and uh, met Bhante Saranapala. And then Bhante said, uh, you know, nice to meet you. I might have an agenda for you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, indeed he did. So later on, uh, many monks, when they're, when they're training as well, one of the things that, uh, at least in the... Uh, forest monasteries, as a young monk, you're heavily discouraged from teaching. Okay? You don't get encouraged to teach for quite some time. And this is partially because the senior monks want you to devote your time to meditation. They don't want you to be involved with, uh, with lay people. And so you almost have almost no interaction with lay people, especially at the monasteries in Thailand. It's more the abbot. Everything flows through the abbot, and the monks are on one side, the lay people are on the other side. And this is also a protection for, uh, for young monks, because you are learning a whole different way of life. So when I come back to, uh, to, to uh, Toronto, I had this kind of very strong desire not to teach. <laughs> I kind of just wanted to uh, practice meditation and uh, didn't want to teach, and uh, just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, do the regular things I've been used to at the monastery, but there was this uh, one time that uh, a friend of mine who I actually went to university with, it turns out that she was a, uh, her family was a kind of uh, going to this temple, this, this temple, <laughs> uh, 
for a long time. So she invited me to Adana, and Bhante happened to be there. And so there was uh, maybe 30 people there, and, uh, and then Bhante gave a talk in English at the beginning, and then he said, uh, and after the dawn is finished, Venerable Atula will give a talk. <laughs> and so I uh, didn't have uh, any choice but to, uh, but to give a talk at that time. And actually this tended, turned out to be a kind of very great blessing, because in the West, at this time, there is not like a very large Buddhist community, actually. Most of the people who come to Buddhism from the West, they were something else before. Their families weren't Buddhists, they didn't know much about Buddhism, and their first contact with Buddhism is often through the monks at the temple. And so that means this is where this kind of a Buddhist culture starts to get built. And so actually it was only once I started to connect with the temples and connect with the community that things started to seem like they were flowing a lot more easily. And kind of all ran into all these, you run into all these problems just staying on your own. But it was once I came to the temples and started to uh, get integrated into the Sri Lankan community, the community at the temples, that my life as a monk seemed to take on a new dimension. And this kind of thing was actually a gift, a kind of gift that was given to me uh, in part by uh, Bhante uh, through his encouragement to teach. It was a gift that was uh, given to me by the communities at the temples. Now, this is one of the amazing things about uh, being a monk. When I first came back to Toronto, I ordained in a Thai tradition. <clears throat> and Thailand and Sri Lanka are separate countries. It's not like, you know, so maybe you have monks going back and forth and all this kind of stuff, but I didn't know any of the monks here in the city, really, by name. I knew some in Ottawa, but I didn't know any here. We, uh, as far as I know, we'd never met as, uh, as monks. But I just showed up at the temple, and immediately all of the communities just integrated me into their communities, into their network. They started inviting me to Donna's. And frequently I would hear this kind of phrase, if you ever need anything, let me know. You know kind of this, uh, this phrase that just gets repeated all the time when you're new and you first come to a Sri Lankan community, which is, if you need anything, let me know. And people really mean that. And so what I tended to find as well is being a Westerner, I never went to church. I never was a real churchgoer as a, as a young kid. And I was basically an atheist. Yeah, just totally you know, anti-religion before I converted to Buddhism. And then from there, Western there, if you go to ordain as a monk, you're, you're mainly hanging around other Westerners, not hanging around people who were raised as Buddhists or who were born as Buddhists. And so what you tend to hang around with are people who have the same cultural background as you, same opinions as you. And one of the things about, there's many wonderful things about Western culture, but one of the things about it is very individualistic. It's not really a community-based culture. It's not necessarily a culture where you'll know your neighbors. <laughs> not necessarily a culture you might not even know some of the people you work with all that well. But I came to these Sri Lankan temples, and everybody knows everybody else. And they know. <laughs> and if they don't know, then they'll find out. <laughs> and at first I was kind of taken aback by this, but. Uh, it's all for a good purpose. If people know about you, then they know how they can help you. They're trying to integrate you into their community. And it felt a little bit like a mosh pit. You know, everybody's seen these kind of mosh pits at like uh, rock concerts where people like uh, fall off a stage and then there's just all these hands. And it's like one little hand, one little hand. Everybody just holds this one person up. Each person just has to do a little bit. And this was the wonderful thing that I noticed about Buddhist culture. Because uh, just going in as a Western, you tend to just go in for the meditation. You know? So I'm here for my psychological reasons, <laughs> to cure my psychological problems, and uh, get more happiness, maybe become more productive at my job, maybe have a better relationship and have less stress, and all these various things. And this is the impetus that drives many Westerners to Buddhism. But the amazing thing that noticed about this Sri Lankan community, the Buddhist community centered around the temples, is that the people in these communities tend to have less stress. And the people in these communities tend to be very helpful. The people in these communities tend to be very happy. 
And what was their secret? And it seemed like their secret was that they had a strong group of people, and that group of people was united around values of kindness, united around values of goodness. And with this as their guiding principle, their communities become like a mosh pit, not to use that word facetiously, but everybody gets held up. One of these things where, if anybody ever saw that movie Forrest Gump, kind of a long time ago, <laughs> and Forrest Gump is uh, in Vietnam with uh, Bubba, his, uh, his best friend, and Bubba says, okay, you know, Forrest, you lean up against me, and I'll lean up against you, and we'll just have a good rest. So they kind of, <laughs> they were in like some war zone, and they just leaned up against each other, and they were able to uh, both have a rest, you know, just kind of leaning against each other. And so for me, coming from a Western cultural background, coming to Buddhism with the desire for Nibbana, but coming to Buddhism without any knowledge of how it really functioned in people's lives, this was something that struck me as a shock. I'd never seen this before, never experienced this before, where you just walk into a building and everybody in the building seems to care about you, care about how well you're doing, care about whether you're healthy or sick, care about whether or not you have enough requisites. And with this feeling of caring comes a great deal of happiness, comes a great deal of ease. Actually, a lot of the ease that one may be looking for can be found right here in communities like this, communities that are centered around good values, communities where people care about one another and wish to support one another. So although as a Buddhist monk, and of kind of striving for enlightenment is, is always at the forefront, especially of what, uh, what the Buddha taught. This was a great gift, kind of, a, kind of a jewel, something that I'd never seen before, but something that I felt in this time in Toronto was given to me, given to me by the community, given to me by monks like Bhante Surnapala, monks like Bhante Ratanasiri, and this is a gift that a person can carry with them. Because it's funny, we never know what's going on in another person's life, really. We can have no clue. Actually, when I came here, I was very sick and can, couldn't eat most foods. Yeah. And uh, living in a Western culture where people don't know anything about monks is not easy if you're a monk. <laughs> people think, when they look at monks, they think, yeah, monk's life must be easy. You don't work, you don't make money, you don't have to worry about kids. A monk's life is not easy. <laughs> And it was kind of funny, okay, well, if the monk's life's easy, you can become a monk. <laughs> we can ordain you and see how it is. A monk's life is not easy, but it's something that becomes very happy with the support of other monks, with the support of the community. And when the Buddha set up his training methods, he gave a lot of prominence to this, gave a lot of prominence to the Sangha, gave a lot of prominence to the community, because this is something that's rare having an assembly of people. People gather together with a common goal, with a common goal to train the mind, with a common goal to find happiness inside. This is one of the things in the West, you find great assemblies of people for things like, you know, Raptors match or whatever, huge numbers of people come out to, it's not a bad thing, I mean, basketball is a fun sport and all this kind of thing. But what we don't find very often is assemblies of people looking to support one another out of kindness, out of a sense of mutual compassion. I mean, it's there, but not explicitly. At places like the temples, places like the monasteries, this is what they exist for. And it's here that we can find communities of people that will support us to go in a different direction, to go against the grain. Because the flow of Western society, the flow of a society based on outward desires leads one way. It leads to houses, it leads to cars, it leads to wealth, which isn't necessarily evil when people need houses, wealth, and cars. But what we tend to find is that when things are based around this, there's a lot of stress. Because if people are our friends because of our physical beauty, if people are our friends because of our house, if people are our friends because of our car, if people are our friends because of our reputation, Inside, we know the day will come when we may lose our house. The day will come when we might lose our car. The day will come when we might get old and sick. The day will come when we might lose our reputation. And there's a lot of stress. Because if those things go, 
and that's what our relationships with people are based on, we might lose those too. But the special thing about temples, the special thing about monasteries, is that they're based on something different. People aren't your friend because of your house, because of your car, because of your reputation. People at temples associate with one another because they're good. That's what status is based on at a temple. That's what status is based on at a monastery. A person's virtue, a person's concentration, a person's wisdom. The nice thing about these things is that they don't disappear when we age. They don't disappear even if people at our workplace insult us, even if our husband or wife divorces us, <laughs> even if our children don't respect us. These qualities of mind remain. And so long as we're in a community that values these qualities, our friends remain. We will still be supported. We'll still be upheld. We'll still be leaning against each other's backs, even if it's a war zone. Even in these situations, we can feel at ease. And this is something that's amazing. This is something that's rare to find in the world. Something that's worth being very grateful for. So having stayed in Toronto these three years, that's the feeling. You never know how long you're going to stay, how long you're going to go, but that's the overwhelming feeling that I tend to be left with, is this kind of feeling of gratitude when people who don't know you at all come out to help you, when monks who you've never met before do their best to try to make sure that you advance in the Dhamma, when even as you're leaving, people are trying to find hats, <laughs> places for you to stay, when whenever you meet somebody they say, if you ever need something, let me know. And they mean it. This right here gives a lot of happiness to life. And this is a jewel that we can all have. This is a jewel that we can all gain. It's a jewel that we can all keep. And it's a jewel that we can find right here, in this hall, in this community, in this temple, with these monks here. So this is one of the interesting things about, uh, at least for myself, growing up in Canada. I know for myself, it's kind of funny because Canada and the United States have this kind of like a big brother, little brother complex. At least, you know, it, I, I, I felt that way, you know. All of the TV shows I used to watch growing up were from the States, you know. The kind of stars were from the States. The big clothing lines were from the States. And so it tended to lead, at least in my mind, to this attitude, well, you know, it's, you know, somebody goes, like Jim Carrey goes to the States, becomes really famous. Oh, he's, you know, Jim Carrey, you know? He became famous in the States, right? Actually, I don't know if anybody knows that comedian, Russell Peters. He's a kind of famous comedian. Actually, before I became a monk, I saw him. He was in Toronto before he became famous. And I remember thinking, yeah, that guy was pretty good. He was a good comic, you know? But when he went to the States, he's all of a sudden very famous. He's a very talented person. But the attitude, at least, that I had in myself was that it's important if it's coming from somewhere else. But if it's right here, then it must not be that important. Or it's important, but not super important. Not like superstar level important. But actually, in Buddhism, it's often the opposite. The things that are far away are the things that are not ours. The things that are right here, right in front of us, those are the things that are most important. This is the big news. Not so much what's going on with Trump. Actually, I don't even know. <laughs> People keep, sometimes they hear things, but you know, whatever. That's the big news in the world. This here is bigger news. The news that's happening right here in this room, the kindness that people show to one another in this room, this is bigger news. The bigger news is the people who've done favors for us when we see them with gratitude. When if they're in trouble, we invite them. If you ever need anything, let me know. This is the breaking news. This is the big headline. And when our lives become reoriented to this, when our minds become reoriented towards the people in our life, the pla places in our life, the situations in our life that have brought good to us, that have done things for us, that have gone out of our way for us, when these become the bright lights in our life, then our life becomes bright. Our life becomes happy. Our life becomes easeful. And it's for this reason that people come to meditate. This is what people are looking for. This is what people want. What people are looking for, what they desire, 
What they want is right here. It's here in this city. It's here in this temple. It's here in this room. It's here right now with the minds and the hearts of the people who practice the Dhamma. It's here with our friends who support us in times of need. It's here with the Buddha's teachings. Because where else could it be? We're the ones who experience the world. We're the ones who create our world. And so long as our world has this goodness, so long as our world has this kindness, so long as this world has gratitude for the people who help us, then our world is bright. We can be like Forrest Gump and Bubba, <laughs> leaning up against each other, even in the middle of a war zone. We can be like those people in a mosh pit, maybe not exactly like that, but even if you fall off the stage in a mosh pit and trip, people will hold you up. <laughs> we can be like this, as long as everybody just does a little bit, to show a little bit of kindness, to show a little bit of compassion towards each other, to look out for one another in times of need, at this temple, in their lives, their lives will become places of ease. And then they'll start to find what they were looking for. So I'd like to express my uh, gratitude, my deep gratitude to Venerable Bhante Saranapala for all of his help and encouragement in my life as a monk over these past three years. I'd like to express gratitude to the chief monk at the temple who has set up this place and has given us the space to practice the Dhamma. And it's been very nice to connect with Dhamma friends here because what we're doing here is special. What we're doing here is important. What we're doing here is big news. Bigger news than Donald Trump. Bigger news than Justin Trudeau. Bigger news than Madonna. I don't know who's a celebrity these days. <laughs> this is the big news. What's going on? in one's mind and heart. This is the most important thing in our life. And it's here that we can shape it to be what we want. So I think that leaves that for reflection. <laughs>